Well, friends, I'm going to pray uh, before we have our Bible reading. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. Uh, we sit under it as your willing and expectant people. We expect you to speak to us today in your word, and we do pray that by your spirit you would apply it to our hearts. We do want to be uh, people who are uh, humble and willing and ready to accept the food of your word as your people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, we're uh, going to be reading from Genesis 14 today. I'll be reading from the Christian Standard Bible. Uh, that'll be on the screen on the website. Uh, you can read along in your own translation at home if you'd like to. So Genesis 14. In those days, King Amraphel of Shinar, King Arioch of Elasar, and King Chador Leoma of Elam, and King Tidal of Goim, waged war against King Bera of Sodom, King Bersha of Gomorrah, King Shinab of Admar, and King Shememba of Zeboim, as well as the kings of Bela, that is, Zoor. All of these came as allies to the Sidim Valley, that is the Dead Sea. They were subject to Chedola Elma for twelve years. But in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year Chedola Elma and the kings who were with him came and defeated the Rephaim in Ashteroth, Canaan, the Zuzim in Ham, the Emim in Shavah Kirathaim, and the Horites in the mountains of Seir, as far as El Paran by the wilderness. Then they came back to invade En Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and they defeated the whole territory of the Amalekites, as well as the Amorites who lived in Hazazon Tamar. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Admar, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zor, went and lined up for battle in the Sidim Valley against King Chedorlaomer of Elam, King Tidal of Goim, King Aramaphel of Shinar, and King Arioch of Elasa, four kings against five. Now the Sidim Valley contained many Ashfelt pits, and as the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into them, but the rest fled to the mountains. The four kings took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food and went on. They also took Abram's nephew, Lot, and his possessions, for he was living in Sodom, and they went on. One of the survivors came and told Abram the Hebrew, who lived near the oaks belonging to Mamre the Amorite, the brother of Eshcol and the brother of Anna. They were bound by a treaty with Abram. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken prisoner, he assembled his 318 trained men, born in his household, and they went in pursuit as far as Dan. And he and his servants deployed against them by night, defeated them, and pursued them as far as Hobar to the north of Damascus. He brought back all the goods and also his relative Lot, and his goods, as well as the women and the other people. After Abram returned from defeating Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the Shave Valley, that is the king's valley. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest to God Most High. He blessed him and said, Abram is blessed by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has handed over your enemies to you. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Then the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people, but take the possessions for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand in an oath to the Lord, God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that belongs to you, so you can never say, I made Abram rich. I will never, I will not take anything from you except what the servants have eaten. But as far as, as for the share of the men who came with me, Anna, Eshkol, and Mamre, they can take their share. Well, as you can now see, you could get pretty lost pretty easily in this passage, couldn't you? So I'm just going to uh, let you know where we're going today. First, I'm going to try and simplify the battle, the whole battle, uh, as these big shots throw their weight around Canaan. And then we'll see Abram's choice to trust his God 
and go and ref- rescue his nephew. But after God gives him the victory, he's faced with another tough choice. What will that choice say about his God? And then we'll see how an impossible choice that Jesus makes says something about that same God and how our choices do the same. So as we'll go, we'll see a lot of choices today that say, my God keeps his promises. So let's jump right into that battle scene. We're at point two. Now here are the players. We've got King Chedorlaomer of Elam and his mates, four kings in all. We're just going to call them King Cheddar. Now, they're from up the north of Canaan. Now, and we've also got King Bera of Sodom and his mates. That's five kings in all. We'll call them King Sodom. They're from the south. King Cheddar and King Sodom. Now, King Sodom's had 12 years under the thumb of King Cheddar, and he's sick of it. Well, King Cheddar hears about it, and he's coming down. On the way down, he defeats a bunch of armies, but not just any armies. Some of these people were the ones that the Israelites would later call giants. They were like grasshoppers to them. They were Rephaim and Amorites and others. And King Cheddar has just squashed them as a sideshow on the, on the way to the main game. Well, that main game happens uh, in a valley of tar pits. King Cheddar's four kings trounce King Soto's five kings and chase the survivors into those tar pits or up into the mountains. They go back to collect the booty, the job's done, they head home. But we'll just pause in the story there for a second and ask a question. Why has the author Moses, as we read out in that passage, included all that squabbling about kings, all that detail? Well, all those kings might be big shots, but they're about to meet the little guy who God is keeping watch over. That's one reason. But two... Moses wants to show us that King Cheddar and his mates are very, very powerful. Look at the giants that they've just flattened. Now that's important for what's coming later in the story. So that's our first point. Now let's see how it fits into Abram's story. You see, God has other plans. King Cheddar didn't know what he was getting himself in for when he messed with Abram. When they dragged Lot away, along with the rest of the people he camped near, remember uh, Lot's um, camping near Sodom and Gomorrah, when those big shots messed with Lot, they're also messing with Uncle Abram. But more importantly, messed with Abram, messed with Abram's God. Now at least one of those survivors runs the distance of a marathon marathon to come and tell Abram uh, about the battle and about his nephew, Lot. Poor old Lot. Things didn't really work out for him in the the fertile valley, did they? They didn't last long, his hopes. But he's not abandoned. Now, at the time, Uncle Abram's living uh, near some uh, oak trees um, owned by a fellow named Mamre and his brothers. Now, Abram's made a you-watch-my-back-I'll-watch-yours kind of treaty with Mamre. Now, imagine this conversation as they hear the news. Abram, okay, fellas, we've got a job to do. We need to go and rescue my nephew, Lot. Mamre brothers. Uh, Sorry, it's a bit late for that, mate. Uh, Marathon man just told you uh, he's already been captured and by King Cheddar. Uh, Did you miss that part? Abram, yes, he has absolutely been captured. There's no time to lose. If we go now, we'll capture him. Round up, you, round up you guys, I'll round up mine. I've got 318 of them. 318 men. Now, we don't know how many his, his uh, memory and his brothers had, uh, but I think the author makes his point, doesn't he? He numbers Abram's fighting force down to the last man. 318 against the armies of four separate kings likely outnumbered 10 to 1, 318 men. Abram chooses to rescue Lot against all odds. What are his chances of survival? They're not worth thinking about, are they? But what does Abram's choice say about who he's counting on, what he's counting on? 
does he just feel 10 feet tall and bulletproof? Or maybe a stoic obligation but without really much hope? No, I think Abram's choice to go says, my God keeps his promises. He's kept them in the past, didn't he? See, so look down there at verse 14. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken prisoner, he assembled his 318 trained men born in his household and they went in pursuit as far as Dan. Now they started this place called Memory, these oaks. Imagine, imagine that's Narrabri and they pursue the armies as far as Dan. Now how far might that be from Narrabri? Would it be, say, the Wheat Research Station or um, Bobbywa Creek, Edgeroy perhaps? Surely not as far as Balada. Well, no, actually it's further. Moree. Mamre to Dan is Narrabri to Moree. That's a 20-hour march that says, my God keeps his promises. Well, they catch Cheddar off guard and defeat him and chase him and his giant conquering mates up to Damascus. And that's, again, about halfway up to Bogabilla from Moree. And then in 16, look, he brought back all the goods and also his relative Lot and his goods, as well as the women and the other people. See, Abram's choice to go said, my God keeps his promises. Now, God hasn't actually said, Abram, if you go and rescue Lot, I'll I'll keep you safe. I'll give you victory over King Cheddar. But what had God already said to Abram? In the previous chapter, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who curse, bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt. And all the people of the, of the earth will be blessed through you. Well, God had certainly kept those promises in Egypt, hadn't he, while Abram was there, even, dis, even despite uh, Abram's lack of trust in his God. So Abram's trust was well-founded, wasn't it? God does keep his promises. But Abram's got another challenging choice coming up. Point four. Well, the last few years have seen a lot of prayer, haven't they, about rain. Some of these prayers have been from people who may not have ever prayed before. But desperate times bring desperate acts, don't they? Now, in this part of the state, God has answered those prayers for rain. For many of those desperately dry times have now passed. Praise God. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful if some of those who had prayed for the first time were to see it's been raining because God has answered their prayers? Wouldn't it be wonderful if they were stopped in their tracks and they turned back to God in faith? Even though the desperate times past, they've turned to God and acknowledged him as the giver of life. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Well, Abram is also in a desperate situation. Now his, he and his band are safe, what's he think, going to think now about his situation? The danger's passed, Lot's been saved, they've collected all the people and the booty. Now the Mamre brothers, I'm sure, are still in a state of uh, shocked relief. What about those ones rescued? Abraham, he's our man. Abraham, he's our man. Surely Abraham's the man of the hour as he travels back to his home among the oak trees. So what's this tough choice he's got? Well, it takes the form of two kings who meet him as he nears his home. There's King Soto, who pops down from the hills, now that's safe. We'll hear from him in a moment. And then there's King Melchizedek. He's a mysterious character. His city, Salem, seems to have been left alone as King Cheddar heads back up home. Now, this Melchizedek is a king and a priest of God. He's an earthly representative of the same God who made his promises to Abram. Now somehow he and his people have maintained worship of the true God even amongst the pressure of all those false gods of Canaan. So he's a king and he's a priest but he's got a kind of an eternal flavour about him because we have no idea where he comes from. Now just as an aside King later, a King David later on says in a psalm, Hey, look, this Melchizedek is an eternal priest king. He's a bit like God's chosen king, isn't he? Well, later on, the writer of the, writer of the Hebrews, after Jesus has come, says, 
And of course, the real eternal priest king is Jesus. But here I think the actual Melchizedek is just a regular human. But he plays a very important part in this story. He's God's representative and he recognises who Abram is. As Melchizedek brings out refreshments to the victors, he declares, verse 18, Abram is blessed by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High who has handed over you, your enemies, to you. Melchizedek understands what's just happened up north. Abram, you are the one blessed by God, approved by the God who owns everything. God gave you that victory. Now let's approve God because he did that for you. He gave those enemies to you because you have his approval. In a sense, Melchizedek sees the events as God sees them. But will Abram see it that way? Abram looked to God when things were desperate, but what about now that he's on top? What does he do? Verse 20. Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Abram gets it too, doesn't he? Standing before him is the earthly representative of God. Abram shows his thanks to God by giving him, God's man, a share of what God gave to him. It's a tangible amen to all that Melchizedek's just said. Absolutely he's blessed me. Absolutely God's kept his promises. Absolutely I'm going to thank him. I approve him as he approves me. Here, Melchizedek, here's a bunch of loot. His choice to give that booty to Melchizedek says, My God keeps his promises. His choice says, My God keeps his promises. Well, what about King Soto who's standing by? What's he got to say? Hmm. Well, it sounds like a very generous offer. Verse 21. Give me the people, but take the possessions for yourself. Wow. He's offering Abram all the stuff that King Cheddar was carrying, including the king's own stuff. That's quite a swag. And all the king's, all King Soto wants is for Abram to hand over the people. Oh, well, maybe he's not such a bad king after all. But hang on a sec. Last time we saw King Soto, he was fleeing with his tail between his legs. Now Abram's just done that king's job for him, saving his people. And the king's trying to strike a deal. But the plunder belongs to Abram. Didn't we just see that? He had a right to give a tenth of it to Melchizedek. So King Soto, you've got nothing. You can't call the shots. You'd be better off begging or perhaps saying, Thank you, Abram, for saving my little kingdom. It's not time to talk business. And so how how does Abram respond? Will he say, Wow, thanks, King Soto, you're a champ. Hardly. Abram's holding all the aces. He's got a right to the loot. Will he let King Soto think he's doing him a favour? I wouldn't think so. Perhaps he'll say, Hey, buddy, um, I won this plunder fair and square. Don't try to give me what I already own. You can take your people, but I'll keep what's mine, thanks. See you later. Well, he'd have a right to do that, wouldn't he? But he doesn't. He's thinking about the God who's kept his promises. I will bless you. I will make your name great. If I take this plunder, thinks Abram, King Soto will claim he's the one who's blessed me. He's the one who's made my name great. No way, pal. God's promised to do that. If keeping this plunder means that you're going to take the credit for something God's done, I don't want to borrow it. So what does he say? Verse 22. I have raised my hand in an oath to the Lord, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that belongs to you, so you can never say, I made Abram rich. So you can keep your stuff, King Soto. But Abram wants to be fair to his allies, his own allies. They've put their lives on the line. And so he he says, in case you don't get it, King Soto, we all have a right to this plunder, but I'm giving up my right so that you can't steal God's glory. 
but my friends will take what's theirs, thanks. Verse 24, I will take nothing except what the servants have eaten, but as far as the share of the men who came with me, Anna and Eshcol and Mamre, they can take their share. Abram's choice to give up his rights says, my God keeps his promises. And as we know, God continued to keep his promises to Abram. And the rest of the Bible pretty much answers two questions. Point five now. First question, how does God keep his staggering promises to Abram and his family? And the second question the Bible answers, how do people get to be part of those promises if they aren't part of Abram's bloodline? In the next few weeks, we'll hear part of those answers. But right now, I want to zero in on just one moment in that bigger story, the moment when God is about to do everything necessary to keep those promises. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He knows that he's the answer to the promises made to Abram. He knows what it will cost him to be that answer. He knows if God's going to keep those promises, he himself will have to go to his death. He knows he'll be cut off from his father when he does, but he believes with all his heart, as God's chosen, he'll rise again from the dead and he'll be crowned as king. We read it before in Psalm 16. You will not allow your faithful one to see decay. At your right hand are eternal pleasures. So with only the word of his father as a guarantee, Jesus willingly submits to his Father's will and to death. Jesus' choice says, My God has given his word, his promise, that through my death and resurrection, he will keep his promise to Abram. Jesus' choice to die says, My God will keep his promises. What about you? How do you fit into this story? Well, if you're a person joined to Jesus, then he's done all he's he's done. Oh, sorry, then all he's done to keep the promises to Abraham, he's done for you too. We're at point five in the outline. See, just like Abraham, there's nothing you can do to earn those promises or add to those promises. Joined to Jesus, they're yours for keeps. God promised he would bless Abram, and promised promised he was for Abram. So join to Jesus, God's promise that he's for you too. Now if we were convinced that God is for us, what a difference that would make to our choices. Choices in all areas of life. I remember only one line from Steph and my uh, wedding sermon. was this. Don't insure yourself to the point you don't allow God to miraculously provide for you. Or we could put the advice like this. Because you know God is for you, you can choose not to build your own refuge, but let God be your refuge like he's promised. And since then, Steph and I have seen so many provisions from God, ordinary but unexpected. Maybe that Certainly they should have been expected. God keeps his promises. Or perhaps you've just received some terrible news. It's awful when you do, isn't it? The bricks in the bottom of the stomach, the, the, the world looking entirely different from what it did just a minute before. Maybe life now needs to be defined by before and after that moment. Can God really be keeping his promises right now? What you choose to then to do then will tell a story, won't it? Will it be a choice to rage against him? Or to take him at his word that he keeps his promises? His word that he's for you. Well, pray that your choice at that moment might say, God keeps his promises. Or perhaps you're looking back like Abram on the battle. Do your choices show that you know that God has already kept his promises to you? I went to Steph and I asked her, can you think of a situation where the choice someone makes now shows that they've seen God's kept his promises? Well, she told me this story from her own life. Well, like many mums, Steph would often have a frazzling day with the kids. 
As part of her afternoon defrazzle, she would find a spot out in the paddock and watch the sun goes down as she smoked a cigarette. For years, there was great satisfaction in that ritual. Or so she thought. One day she just said to herself, I've been kidding myself. The satisfaction I thought I got from this ritual is nothing compared to the deeper and deeper contentment that I realize I'm finding in Jesus. She'd been giving credit to the smokes, but God was actually the one giving her the contentment. And her choice to give up the smokes said, my God keeps his promises. He's for me. He's promised to be my satisfaction, and he has been. I don't need these now. See, her choice said, my God keeps his promises. Or perhaps it's a choice to say or not say something at work or to your wife or your husband or your parents or your children. A choice that says, my God has kept his promises and he will do. I don't need to defend myself here. God is for me. Or I can speak up here and say what's right. It doesn't matter what they think. God keeps his promises. He's promised that he's for me. Oh, that our God might turn our hearts towards himself so that that those who are joined to Jesus would know that he is for us. That our choices, like our whole lives, like Abraham, like Jesus, would be a public monument that says, my God keeps his promises. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who keeps his promises. May you apply those promises to our heart in Jesus, all the promises you've made which you have fulfilled in him. We pray that we might be people of great satisfaction and contentment and peace, knowing that you keep your promises to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.